Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me. I am here with Amy Lada again, which is really exciting for me because we got to do a lettering one last time, and we're going to get to kind of expand on that a little bit and be creative, which, if you know me, is kind of funny because uh, I try real hard, and you'll all actually get to see my artwork tonight, so that'll be fun for some of us. Um, so Amy Lada is the best-selling author of Hand Lettering for Relaxation, Hand Lettering for Laughter, Hand Lettering for Faith and Expressing Yourself, a Hand Lettering Workbook for Kids. She has appeared on Hallmark's Home and Family Teaching Hand Lettering, and her designs have been featured nationally in Starbucks and Gap stores. Amy lives in Hampstead, Maryland. Uh, to learn more, you can reach out at Amy Lada. that's A-M-Y-L-A-T-T-A, creations.com. So Amy, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I am really excited to have you here. I have, no one else can see it except for you yet, my blank na notebook, my paper, so we're gonna see how that looks by the end. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much for inviting me back. I was really excited to get your request. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about my newest book, which is called Practice Makes Progress. Mm -hmm. And at any time, um, I know, Drew, you said that people can live interact uh, through the YouTube stream. So if you see some questions or comments or anything that you would like me to address, please go ahead and cut in and let me know. Because I would love to be able to chat with you um, if there's anything you'd like to know about the book or lettering or me. Um, but the first thing that I really want to emphasize about this newest book is that it's actually not a lettering book. And that's a big surprise for a lot of folks because I think after you kind of get in a niche and, you know, you put five books out there in the planet, you know, and they're all about hand lettering, you put a new book out and people are like, oh, I know what that is. But it's actually very different this time. So Practice Makes Progress is what we call a guided creativity journal. And this is a project that is really close to my heart because my whole goal in everything that I do, when I share on my blog, when I share on television segments, when I teach workshops like this one and at Pinner's Conference, it's always designed to help people see that they really can be creative. I've had so many people come up to me over the years and say, oh, you're so creative. I can't. I won't. I don't. And that just breaks my heart because creativity is such a great form of self-expression. It's a great way to relax. It's almost like therapy. And so I feel like it's such an important thing for everyone to experience and to embrace. So basically, my goal with my entire business has always been to reach everyone from people who think that they can't even draw a stick figure to people who are professional artists and people who are hobbyists and everyone in between and help them to explore and discover and embrace their own creativity. So my hand lettering is what really seemed to resonate with folks the most for a while. So I focused on writing some books about that. That's sort of what was needed in the market at the time. But now I want it to turn my attention to something that would be relevant for everyone who is any kind of a crafter, a creator, a maker, or who wants to be and feels like they're not. So that's what Practice Makes Progress is all about, and that's who it's for, literally everyone. <laughs> Anybody who is old enough to read and write, all the way up to, I just gifted a copy to my 100-year-old one, uh, my 101-year-old grandmother-in-law, wow. and she's been going through it, which is really cool. So ages, you know, maybe five or six to 101 can <laughs> enjoy this book. Um, but basically, it's divided up into 25 different chapters based on 25 quotes about creativity. And these are not quotes that I made up. They're quotes that you may have heard before. And they're, um, you know, some of them are said by famous people. You may have heard before, comparison is the thief of joy. And if you take a look, you can see my workstation there. You can see I've illustrated these. You've got creativity is contagious, pass it on, said by Albert Einstein. Um, it's not necessary for an artist to be crazy, but it helps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so some of these are serious quotes and some of these are, you know, lighthearted. Um, we don't make mistakes. We just have happy accidents by Bob Ross, who's one of my favorite artists. Um, so lots of different um things that relate to creativity uh success usually comes to those who are too busy looking for it uh too busy to be looking for it so each one of these quotes what i did was i wrote a little reflection about how i think that it relates to creatives and just some of my thoughts about it and then you'll see that each chapter 
has a series of exercises that are based on the topic of that quote. Um, and so some of them are things that you can do right here in the book. There's some lines for writing and you know, you'll see here, there's a list of things and you're to circle the ones that associate with you, that you resonate with. And then there is always at least one prompt at the end of the chapter, along with a blank page that encourages you to take your creativity off the page and to express it in whatever ways you like the most. Mm -hmm. So maybe you like to woodwork, or maybe you're a sculptor, maybe you're a painter, a musician, maybe you write poetry, maybe you're a creative in the kitchen. My son loves to bake, and he's one of those that will tweak the recipe. Like, mm -hmm. that's not me. If I tweak the recipe, something is going to fail, and <laughs> you're going to choke. And so, you know, that's not me. My son has that gift of creativity. He is mm -hmm. the one that will add a little more of this or a bit of that. And, you know, he wants to go to culinary school and that's the way that he expresses his creativity. So we all express it in different ways. So these prompts are intended to be open-ended so that you can go off the page and you can do whatever it is that you do. So for example, one of these asks you to create something with the intention of giving it away, which we're gonna talk about more in a little bit here. Mm -hmm. For me, I might make a card and fill it and send it to someone, but my son might bake a dozen snickerdoodles for a friend. Mm -hmm. So it could look very different depending on who you are and how you like to express your own creativity. So that's just kind of how the book is set up. It's designed to be a journey for you. And like I said, it doesn't matter what kind of experience you have or what kind of creating you like to do or would like to do. Um, there's something in here for everyone. Excellent. Okay. I, I wanted to be. Do you have a question from the live stream audience? Um, they want to know how did you choose the quotes? Well, that's great. And also, if uh, it, we've got a little bit of a feedback issue, so as you're as you're leaning, I'm I'm getting like some ripple. So okay. talk, and I think you're good there. Okay, I'll sit up really straight and be good. <laughs> say, I think it's I think you're good if you're forward or back. It's when you move a little bit, we get a little bit of a of a of a, ver, a verbato kind of thing going. It'll be good. Um, so, a great question. I still, uh, still having a little bit of audio issue. Um, are you using? Oh, you're using a mic there. Yeah. Hang on my shirt. Hang on. Yeah. Let me try to get the mic up. All right. How are we sounding? I don't hear you. Here. Oh. Oh. Can Hello. Can you? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Is it, do you have feedback now? Nope. No feedback. Okay. Let me know if it changes. If it's something with the mic pack, I can just switch to my computer. Sure. So far, we're, we're sounding good, though. Okay. So, how so, do you come up with the quotes? I think is the question. But yes, that is the question. Yes. So, for the quotes, um, I Googled quotes about creativity. Mm -hmm. There were some that immediately came to mind before I even did a search. I knew that I wanted comparison is the thief of joy because that's one that I've heard a million times and it resonates with me in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, I also knew that I wanted the one by Picasso about how every child is an artist, but the problem is remaining one once mm -hmm. we grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were several that I kind of had in mind as things that I knew I wanted to include. And then I did a Google search and I just looked up all kinds of quotes about creativity as well as there are some quotes in here, like the one, the Madeline Langle one about success, that's not specifically about creativity, it's more about success, but it's the way that we apply it as creatives and makers. So I also looked for you know inspirational quotes and I knew there were certain things I wanted to tackle, like organization and creating a space where you feel like you can be creative. So uh, sometimes if I knew a particular facet of creativity that I wanted to talk about, I would search for that if I wasn't finding a quote that was addressing it. Um, but I just read through a bunch of quotes for about a week and I made a list of all the ones that I liked best. And then I went back through to make sure that they were each unique enough that I could talk about a different aspect mm. because I didn't want multiple chapters that were basically saying the same thing. Of course. So yeah, so I went through and chose my favorites and I had some back and forth with my editor too. And I sent some things to her and you know, she kind of helped me narrow down which ones we really wanted to focus on because I could only choose 25 and I had about 40 that I loved. <laughs> so, you know, maybe there's a part two, but, um, 
that was basically what I did. I just uh, looked for things that talked about creativity and different things I wanted to touch on and then chose my favorites. Perfect. Great question, Any other great questions answer. so far? So far, I think we're good. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to give you a peek at a few of these chapters and just let you see how they work. Um, so one of them that I wanted to show you is that Picasso quote that I was talking about, about every child being an artist mm -hmm. and kind of retaining that as we grow up. And this, I think, is one of the really fun chapters because it does tap into that childlike wonder. Mm -hmm. um, so I, for my reflection here, I said several years ago when my son Noah was in elementary school, I got to be a long-term substitute for his art teacher. My favorite thing about that experience was seeing the absolute confidence with which the kids approached each project. They fully believed they were about to create something wonderful and it was refreshing to watch. Why is it that somewhere along the way our childlike joy gets replaced with responsibility and skepticism? What happens to the confidence that we can make anything with a pair of scissors, some glitter, and a jar of paint? They know that art is not about perfection. It's about the fun of letting your imagination go wild. Isn't it time to let the child inside each of us capture that joy again? So then the first little question asks, have you ever watched a child create something? What do you remember about that experience? And if you haven't, then what do you remember about creating art yourself as a child? And then we get to the fun stuff like my favorite doodle. And I show here, this is any time that I would just kind of doodle as a child, this is basically the picture I would draw. We had a little house and so I would draw a small house with mm -hmm. the peaked roof and we had a big tree in our yard, a big maple tree. So I would always draw that and then a little sidewalk leading up to it. And so it asks you just to kind of reconnect with whatever it was that you really liked to draw. Maybe it was animals or maybe you would draw pictures of your family or whatever it might have been or, you know, baseball or something else that you enjoyed. And just to kind of um, remember back to what it was like when you were a child making art. Um, and then it asks you to reflect on drawing that thing again. How did it make you feel? Um, do you see traces of your early art in what you create today? Things like that. And um, then I talk about the artist toolbox and I've got pictures of things here like scissors, paint, glue, clay, beads, buttons, a pencil. And it asks you to either color in or circle the things that you liked to create with as a child. Then in the empty toolbox to put some things that you create with today. And then we've got um, a place to reflect on that and the comparison. And then I ask you to create a nostalgic project. Um, and this just gives you an example of how you can take it off the page in different forms. So if you like writing, you could write a poem offering advice to your younger self. You could draft a story from a child's point of view. Uh, if you love visual arts, you could paint, sketch, carve, stamp, or embroider something memorable from your childhood, mm -hmm. um, compose or play a song that reminds you of your youth. So those are just some ideas to kind of connect you uh, with your child self as an artist. Um, but that's kind of how the chapters work. You've got that reflection, then you've got exercises. Some are a little bit more directed as to exactly do this. And then the others are open ended. So you get to do whatever it is that you think would be the most fun. Um, so that's just kind of a look at that chapter. And then this is the last prompt in that chapter called Everything is Art. Uh -huh. um, it's my favorite one. And this is and you'll notice throughout the journal, there are pages that are intended for you to go ahead and cut things out or, you know, sometimes there's going to be something like a postcard where you would cut it out and give it away to somebody or draw something and hang it up. Um, and on the back, we purposely made sure that you weren't going to be cutting out the quotes or the the other mm -hmm. exercises and mm -hmm. things. So it's a page, it's a throwaway page yeah. that you can thing um, with. We do have another question from the live stream. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you grow? Oh, I think they mean view, and they said view. Okay. Do you view creative pursuits to be therapeutic? Also, with the reflections, is this book supposed to be somewhat therapeutic? Yes, yes, absolutely. I find all of this to be so much like therapy, and sometimes cheaper. Although <laughs> once you add up all the craft supplies, maybe not. Sure. Um, but I really do. I feel like you know, my first hand lettering book is called Hand Lettering for Relaxation, mm -hmm. and that's no accident. Um, it's you know, I was talking to my publisher about how coloring, adult coloring, has become so meditative. It's something that we never really outgrow because there's just something about that mindfulness of just sitting there and coloring like i like to do their adult paint by numbers mm -hmm. it's um 
you know, like a big landscape or a beach scene, or you can even get family photos turned into these amazing paint by numbers. And they're really teeny tiny little spaces. So they're not at all like the ones you did as a kid. And they're on these big, like 16 by 20 canvases. And it'll take me three weeks to finish one. But it is, it's absolutely just like meditation because you're not thinking, you're just doing, you're just allowing yourself to kind of process things and you're just working through this relaxing um, hobby. And it's interesting, I was looking at some statistics. I gave a speech recently about the importance of creativity to a bunch of real estate agents in my local town. Oh, cool. They asked me to come and speak for their event. And it said that, especially when you're doing repetitive motion, like if you're painting, crocheting, knitting, all of that stuff, that um, it actually soothes anxiety and it can help even patients with dementia. It was talking about how they use creativity as therapy for dementia patients and how it can help reconnect them to their memories. And like, I've actually seen that my husband and I are ballroom dancers and we used to dance with this older couple and she had dementia and she couldn't remember our names sometimes. And we would sit with them every week, but she would get on the floor and when she would start to dance with her husband, she could still do the Viennese waltz and the tango and the quick step and, you know, things I couldn't even do. <laughs> it, it came back to her because that part of her brain was engaged and it was amazing to watch that. So yes, in answer, <laughs> a very long answer to your question. Yes, I think it's therapeutic. And yes, this is meant to be a form of therapy sort of as well and yeah. something to lift your spirits, something to help you relax, uh, to focus on something good. Goodness knows we need that <laughs> right now. Very um, much so. so and yeah, I, absolutely. And to, and to add on to your sort of answer there, Amy, and I, I don't know if this has been the similar experience that you've had. I was having a really uh, in-depth conversation with a very close friend, and we were you know, sort of talking through hard subjects, good subjects, growing as people, and, and one of the things that she asked me, it really threw me, and it took me a long time to answer, and I, at the time, I, I didn't have an answer. I sort of was like, oh, I need to think on that, is you know, how, do you wanna, how do you intend to live more creatively? What does that mean to you? And I think that you know, so often we get caught up in the idea of progress. How am I going yeah. to heal? How am I going to do better? How am I going to not be afraid of, you know, pick a thing these days, it feels like. Um, that we sort of forget that that's not really what we're supposed to, like, I don't want to like, like what we're here for, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to enjoy life and to do creative things. And creativity, as you pointed out, isn't just necessarily, you know, drawing or painting. It can be all sorts of things. It's, it's creating and that's being creative. So I, to me, it's such a, the, the book you created is such an interesting answer to that question of how do you intend to live more creatively? I think it's a fun way to sort of approach that. And I think, you know, the, the question we had and the answer you gave her are spot on. I think you're right. It is therapeutic, 100%. Everyone I know doodles. Everyone I know, yep. if you give someone a pen and a piece of paper and you leave them alone for an hour and you come back and there's nothing on that piece of paper, they might not be a person. I don't know. Like, it would just, that'd be so, <laughs> everyone doodles. Everyone, you know, makes little tick marks or whatever it is. Right. Or maybe they wrote a story. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. There's just so many forms that people do express their creativity and they don't see it. Like my dad, um, he spent his entire career as a bricklayer and a stonemason. And he would tell you, if you were sitting here next to me, that he's not creative. And he would say, oh, you're the creative, you're the artsy one, and not me. You didn't get that from me, but I did. I mean, I got it from both my parents. But if you were to look at one of the fireplaces he built out of stacked stone or one of those sidewalks, I mean, they're masterpieces. They're absolutely stunning. The way that he arranged things, like he just had a sense for, you know, how to stack them and what to put where and the colors. And, you know, he doesn't see it, but anyone who looks at his work sees it. And I feel like so many people fall in that category. There's something that they do that expresses that part of themselves. And, you know, they are their worst critic. You know, they're the ones that say, oh, I can't. Because I think we tend to look at art or creativity in such a tiny box. We think it has to be bob ross with a canvas and a paintbrush painting happy little trees mm -hmm. and if you can't paint or you can't draw well then you're not an artist and that could not be farther from the truth mm. no i agree completely and that's not just because i can't draw happy little trees although <laughs> although it's it's and it's and for me uh. <laughs> oh so um so back to the journal yes. so this page is one of my favorites because like I said, it's meant to be cut out so you can color these little things. And then the idea is it says to think outside the box and create like a kid again. 
color and cut out the eyes and the facial features, and then use adhesive dots or tape to attach them to everyday objects. And if you don't want to cut this out, the easiest solution is Google eyes. Mm -hmm. I have an entire jar of Google eyes down here. Mm -hmm. And I did this, I actually was uh, talking to the book club at my son's high school. And I went in and I told them about this and I gave out Google eyes and adhesive dots. And they were putting them on staplers and on their cell phones and their binders and their shoes. And it was so funny because everything just comes to life when you give it Google eyes. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's hysterical. I had a pair on the back of my phone for like three weeks because they didn't fall off. And they, were, they were just so funny. And every time I saw it, it just made me smile because mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the easiest ways to create art. And sometimes we have to give ourselves permission to be silly oh, like yeah. we were as kids. So that's one of my favorite poems in the whole book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then I wanted to share with you this one. Uh, creativity is contagious. Pass it on. And in this one, I just talk about the way that creativity is not meant to be just for us. It's not something we were meant to store up and keep to ourselves. Instead, when we use it, we inspire those around us to do the same. One way to pass on our creativity is share the things we make with others. Whether we gift our creations to the people in our lives or sell them to folks we've never met, sharing our work is a significant act. Another great method for helping others catch the creativity bug is teaching them how to do what we do. And I share a story about how years ago, a friend of mine came and taught me how to make beaded jewelry. And it was something I had always wanted to do, but I didn't know how. So she brought all her supplies and tools over and I absolutely loved it. And it became like one of my favorite ways to express my creativity. I've made more pieces of jewelry since then than I can count. Um, and so it, it's all because she shared her knowledge. Instead of giving me a pair of earrings, she gave me the gift of being able to make myself a pair of earrings. Um, so sometimes teaching one-on-one -on -one or leading a little workshop or an instructional class um, can be a wonderful way to help inspire someone else. So there's lots of ways that we can share our creativity, whether it's through a physical thing or through just sharing what we know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things here asks you to think about what areas of expertise do you have? You know, maybe it is baking or maybe it's something musical or whatever it is. You know, what are the things that you could instruct somebody else how to do? Um, and then it encourages you to think about places locally where you could share your different forms of creativity. Um, and there's a little graphic organizer there if, if you like to plan out like that. And the off the page prompt encourages you to make something with the intention of giving it away. Mm -hmm. um, and so tonight I wanted to, I know you guys wanted a little demonstration of some art. So I oh, we got a little bit of, little bit of feedback again there. Oh no. no? Okay, something that you could do that you can give away. Mm -hmm. So what, um, you know, since St. Patrick's Day is right around the corner and we always think of shamrocks and rainbows, I thought we would talk about rainbows tonight. Yes. Um, and so we're going to take a look at how to do these boho rainbows. Okay. And these can be done on a canvas or they can be done as a card, which I have an example of here. Um, and this is something where I know you guys didn't necessarily come prepared with supplies, which is totally fine that's the beauty of YouTube is that you can watch this again later and Drew's also popping a link in the chat I believe yes um, that is for the first comments. link if you if you Wait. are in the chat and you see there's a little link at the very top of the, of the live stream chat that's the very first thing you can click it right there and if you are watching this later on it should still be there if it's not for some reason check your email because it did go out in our email that we sent everyone letting them know about the event tonight so it is out there I promise and just for fun yes. I'll throw it up there one more time Yes, and if for some reason you can't find it, go to amylattacreations.com and on my homepage, I actually shared these on Hello Iowa uh, TV today, so it's on the on TV thing too, you can click oh, on perfect. it. Um, but it has instructions on how to do the boho rainbows, so if you want to go back and just have a photo tutorial um, rather than watch the whole video again, you can totally do that. Or if you would love to hear my voice some more, and Drew, <laughs> you, can, you can always watch us all day long. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're here for you. Mm -hmm. So. So for those of us so, who may not know, a boho rainbow. Yes. So we're going to talk about what makes this boho. So you'll notice that there are a couple of things that set apart from the kind of rainbow that you learn how to draw in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So one thing is the shape. Mm -hmm. So typically, if I were just to draw a regular rainbow, it would be a wider, lower arch. Boho rainbows typically are taller and thinner, more like a big upside down U. 
Gotcha. The other thing, well, one other thing that you'll notice is that the color stripes are not touching each other because we're actually taking advantage of some of that white space. Also, you'll notice that the color scheme is different. So we don't have a Roy G. Bib rainbow here. Now you certainly could, if you're feeling sad about not having all the way red through purple, you can <laughs> do whatever you want, it's your rainbow. Um, but one of the things that makes the boho rainbow, they're very popular right now, very on trend, and it's sort of like a modern twist on, you know, the kid rainbow. And so what we do is we use a different color scheme. And a lot of times what you'll see is that people are combining things in the same color family. So we'll have like different shades of the same color. So I've got all my pinks here. I've got lots of different purples here. I have one next to me that's my St. Patrick's Day greens. Uh, you can also do like some people will do maybe three different colors and different shades of them, but it's not that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple that we grew up with. Um, so it's a little bit more modern, sophisticated. You'll notice, you know, adults are kind of drawn to these. Um, and then the other difference is the embellishments. You know, when we used to draw our typical rainbow with our crayons, we just did our colored stripes, maybe put some clouds on the end and we were done. Uh, but these are all about the embellishing. So you go back and you're going to go into your stripes, in between your stripes, then you're going to add patterns. So maybe you're going to do little diagonal lines or maybe some dots and dashes. And we're going to walk through this together. Um, but that's kind of some of the things that set this type of rainbow apart from the one that you learned how to draw as a child. Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes back to the prompt where we were talking about the nostalgia too. It would tie in with that because it's something we used to draw as a child and now we're putting our grown-up spin on it. So that's a lot of fun too. So to make these, first of all, if you want to make a card, all you need is a piece of cardstock and you're just going to cut it in half and then fold it in half and that'll give you a nice little size for a card. And if you want, you can do a wall canvas instead or also this is an eight by 10 canvas. I just got a 10 pack at Walmart for like $9. So really good. Deal. Okay. Um, so you can get something you want to hang up or something that you want to give as a card, or you can do it on literally anything you want. Uh, then you're just going to need markers in whatever colors you want and a fine tip black marker to do your embellishments and your lettering. So I'm going to switch to my not quite finished rainbow. Okay. And if you want to grab a few markers to play along, feel free. And again, like I said, you can kind of watch the demonstration and come back later and do your project if you prefer. Mm. So for this one, I started with my pinks. I started with the darkest one. And the markers that I used for this are actually really cool. They're Tombow ABT Pro markers. And these are double tipped. So they have a brush tip end. But what I used to do this was a chisel tip. And then as I went around, it stayed a consistent width, which I liked. Okay. Um, and these are alcohol based, which is why I like them for the canvas, because sometimes water based markers on canvas are not a good idea, because if anybody touches it and, you know, especially if you have little people in your house, <laughs> they might or your dogs, you never know um, if they come and they touch it, then water based is going to smear on that canvas. So the alcohol based marker or any kind of permanent marker is really nice but these come in 108 different colors mm -hmm. which is why i prefer them to like just a sharpie because yep. then i get all of the gradient colors within the color family mm -hmm. so that's my little ad for tombow abt press <laughs> um, but i went through and i just kind of went from my darkest pink color to my lightest one you can make as many of these color stripes as you like i typically do between three and five colors um, but it's totally up to you how many you want to do and you're just going to make those tall, thin arches, each one a little bit smaller and leaving some white space in between. Mm -hmm. Then we get to do the fun part and embellish it. So the first thing I did was I outlined my smallest, lightest one, because sometimes the lightest ones don't show up really well on their own. So I like to outline that one. Mm -hmm. And then as we're embellishing, you're just going to be choosing different patterns. So right now I'm going to be doing a series of X's and this is also a permanent marker because that works the best on the canvas. And you'll notice that this time I'm doing my X's in that white space that's in between my color stripes. So you can add the embellishments to the stripes themselves or you can do it in those spaces. And the nice thing about this is that the boho style is very forgiving and it's very 
handmade. It's all about, you know, the process, like we were talking about, it's all about it being therapy. It's all about, you know, whatever you create is art. And so don't worry if your lines aren't perfectly straight and all your X's aren't exactly the same. They're not supposed to be. It's just supposed to be you kind of, um, it's almost like when you do like the Mandela or one of those things, you know, where you're just kind of into creating that pattern or like the Zentangle, those kinds of things. Yeah. So you're just going through and you're going to like this one. I'm going to do some dots in my second layer here. So while you and, do that, what, is, what is it that boho stands for? Is it Bohemian. Huh? Yeah. So it's all about that, you know, free spirited lifestyle. You know, it's basically like a hippie rainbow. Gotcha, <laughs> That's gotcha, what we're gotcha. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like I said, very on trend right now. You'll see lots of this stuff. In fact, I just bought Walmart had dish towels on sale for like 97 cents. And there was one with a whole bunch of little boho rainbows on it. And I bought it. So <laughs> I totally, I, I just did. My son and I just got back from Walmart <laughs> like awesome. an hour before the class. That's awesome. So, yeah. So I'm doing dots on this one. And then the great thing about this is especially for people who aren't so sure about their own artistic abilities mm. is that there's no right or wrong like absolutely okay. no it should be this way or it can't be that way like whatever you do is awesome and so any kind of pattern any kind of embellishment anything you want to do is great so however much embellishing you want to do if you want to add glitter you can add glitter um, but that's kind of how we're going to create our boho rainbow. And then across the bottom, you'll notice that I've written some words. So like on this one, I wrote peace because that's kind of on my heart right now. Yeah. And I also did lucky on my St. Patrick's Day one. And then on cards, sometimes I'll do smile or love you. Um, and I do that in my hand lettering, my faux calligraphy. So I wanted to walk you through the basics of that so that you can write a word with your rainbow. Okay. So to do the lettering, all we need is a piece of paper and a writing utensil. Uh, it usually works best if you have a small bullet tip marker, but if you only have a pencil, you can use a pencil. If you only have a ballpoint pen, use a ballpoint pen. You can totally do this. Okay. I'm here. So, I got my pen out, so we're going to see. Okay, we're going to see. I wish you guys could see how excited Drew is right now. Oh, yeah. It's um, a grimace of pain and fear in my face. It does it. <laughs> I want the dogs to do it, too. Oh, yeah. They're like, yeah, give us a pet. That'd be a great plan. We'll yes, exactly. So we're going to start with the word joy. And yeah. what we're doing here is something that's called faux calligraphy. I'm going to write that down so that you can remember. And all of this is on my website at amylattacreations.com. Mm -hmm. And while you won't find hand lettering instruction in this new book, you will find it in all five of the previous books. Mm -hmm. So feel free to tell Drew that you want all of them on the shelf yes. and that you, <laughs> you would like a copy of each. But um, faux calligraphy is basically the quick and easy way that anyone can get this brush script look that we all love so much. So brush script is what we call this style of writing that I have here for the word love. And if you look at it, you'll notice that the thing that distinguishes it from other kinds of script is that inside each letter, there are thin lines and thick lines. Mm -hmm. So in the L, we've got a thin line and a thick one. Same thing for the O, we've got thick parts and thin parts. Every single letter has some thick and thin. And so our first job is to figure out, well, where does that happen? Because we can't just go thickening everything or we have bold. So we have to figure out which parts of the letters are supposed to be the thick parts. So anytime that we're writing, our pen is moving across the paper in one of three basic directions. Okay. Sometimes our pen is moving up on the paper away from us, and we call that an upstroke. Okay. Pretty easy to remember because that's the direction it's going. Sometimes our pen is moving down on the paper toward us. That is called a downstroke. And then, of course, we occasionally have diagonal or horizontal lines. They're just kind of going across the paper. So this will just be a horizontal stroke. Now, the key to doing our faux calligraphy is that downstrokes are thick and 
everything else is thin. So what we have to do is look at the letters that we wrote and ask ourselves, where were we making a downstroke? Because that's the part that needs to be thick. Okay. So let's write our word joy and then look at how we do that. So I'm just going to write J-O-Y. And we're going to go back and look at that J. So as I was writing, my pen starts by moving up away from me. So I'm going to leave that first line alone. I want it to stay thin. Okay. Then my pen switches direction on the stem of the J and I'm moving down. To make this thicker, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a second line next to my first one. Then I'm going to color the space in between. And what that does is it makes that downstroke on my J thicker than the other parts of it. Mm -hmm. Then at the bottom here, I switch directions again and I'm moving up. And remember, upstrokes are thin, so we're going to leave that as it is. When we come over to the O, our first move that we make is going to be a downstroke. So we're going to draw a second line and we're gonna color it in on the left side there to make that part thicker. Okay. As we hit the bottom, we're gonna go up again, so we're leaving it alone. And if you have a loop in your O like I do, you have a little tiny downstroke where that came around. If you are someone who writes your O like this without a loop, you only have the downstroke on the side. Then we come over to our Y and this first piece here is a downstroke, so we're going to make our double line and color it in. Then we went back up. Now we have another one of these descenders like we did for the J, so we're going to make our line and we're going to color it in. And then we go back up. And that is what Joy looks like in this brush script or faux calligraphy style. So it's very intentional that the thick parts of our letters are the places where our pen was moving down on the paper. So now that you've done that once, I want you to do the word joy a second time. Now we know where the downstrokes are, so we're gonna go back in with more confidence. We're gonna draw those double lines, we're gonna color them in, and that's gonna give us our brush script joy. Now one of the questions that I always get is, let's say I've got my J, which side of the downstroke am I going to put that second line on? The answer is there's no concrete answer. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So honestly, what you want to do, because either one is fine, there's there's no wrong answer, which is good. Um, so what happens is as I'm writing my word, sometimes I'll have a situation where two of my letters are closer together than my others. So like my O Y are a little closer than my J O. So I'm gonna put my line here on the right side of the J and the left side of the O to close that space in a little bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Yep, exactly. You'll like. So then, yep, so we're just kind of eyeballing it mm -hmm. and we're figuring out where it makes the most sense. Gotcha. Now, right now, is your camera on still? Because it looks like we lost the overhead view. I feel like my phone died. Yep, I think <laughs> it might have, but that's okay. It's because you know what? It, Even though your phone is dead, I'm going to do the thing I said I wasn't going to do, and I'm going to show everyone what I made. Yay! So let's keep in mind that uh, regardless of how this looks, this is my artistic ability, not the quality of instruction. So let's <laughs> remember that very clearly. So this is what we've got, and I don't know if anyone can see it. I don't know if it's Yay! flipping or not. I, feel I see it. Does it, does it flip it. or is it backwards for you guys? That's correct. I see it the right way. Okay. If you'll ignore my other work notes. Um, so, yeah, that's... I Actually, I feel pretty good about it. This was the first one I did, and then this was the one a little less carefully. But I, I'm, I'm like pleasantly surprised by how easy that turned out. So, if you are at home and you're looking at this, I, when I say I am the least artistic, not creative, but least artistic person I know, and I can do this... I promise you can as well. So that yes. is that is that high praise. I I am and someone in the in the live stream says looks amazing. So thank you, person, a kind internet stranger. I appreciate <laughs> you. <laughs> we love kind internet strangers. There are way too many unkind ones. So. Exactly. 
<laughs> we will take all the encouragement we can get. Um, but yeah, so that's the basic way that we're doing the faux calligraphy is we just go back into the word, find those down strokes. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a second line, color it in, and that gives us the combination of thick and thin. So if you want to write a word other than joy, what are we going to do? We're going to think about how we wrote that word. So I would encourage you to try writing a different word. So like I'm going to write my name and I know you can't see it overhead, but I'll hold it up. Um, so as you write your different words, you're going to come back to your letters and say, okay, when I was writing the A, the first thing I did was go down. So that's going to be a place where I make a second line and I'm going to color it in. And then when I hit the bottom of that A, I went back up. So I'm going to stop. And then I went down again, so I'm going to make a second line, and I'm going to color it in. And you can work through your letters that way. Just any time that your pen moved down, that's the spot. Now, to make it easier for you, on my website, I have a ton of free printable practice pages that have the whole alphabet on them. So if you yes. go to emulatacreations.com, and Drew, you might be able just to kind of grab this link toss it in. Mm -hmm. If you go to emulatacreations.com, there's a top menu across my website and it'll say free practice pages. And if you just click on that, there's, um, you can scroll down and I actually have practice pages for every single letter of the alphabet. Um, and then there are some that have the entire lowercase alphabet, the entire uppercase alphabet. Um, so you can print out as many times as you want and just kind of keep working through that. But you can use that as a reference guide and my other books also have alphabets in there as a reference guide mm -hmm. so that you have something to look at as you're practicing yeah and that way you know where the thick parts and thin parts are supposed to be doesn't mean that you have to form your letters exactly the way that i do mm -hmm. it just shows you this is where my pen moves down when i write this particular letter if that makes sense and i'm going to um, definitely yeah. take advantage of that because the word i chose was wings and with w i and n no, no, I'm gonna pick a different word. I'm gonna pick a word. Oh no, no, you can totally do it. Oh, uh, okay. Gonna... You can totally do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> and if there's any particular letter that anybody wants to see, let me know, and I can write that. Um, but basically, when you're making your project, I just went across the bottom. So after I had my rainbow, then I just took my marker and went across the bottom. And I did that faux calligraphy to write my word to finish it off. And I, <laughs> for better or worse, tend not to be very meticulous with my planning. Um, I don't mind if something is a little off center because, um, for example, this one ended up being a little off center. So I made a heart <laughs> and I evened it out with the heart. And um, I'm okay with that. But some people want to be a little more precise, which is fine. So if that's you, you can use a pencil on your canvas or your cardstock and kind of sketch out your letter positions, and then you can trace over them and erase your pencil after the marker is dry. So if you're somebody who's going to be really bothered if your word's not perfectly centered, that would be my recommendation <laughs> is to do it in pencil, and then you can go back um, and trace over it and erase any errant pencil lines when you're done. Oh, well, that's the eye, isn't it? Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Well, the problem with the W moving into I is like you go up on the W and then you've got to like come straight down and come across to do the I. Otherwise, you, you do what I did, which is the outside of the W, the right hand side ends up being turned into the I, which I'm going to just, I'm going to do that again. I'm going to just redo that okay. over here. I got this. So I'm going to do a WI for you and hold it up so you can see it. Now I have a little loopy on the end of my W. You don't have to make a little loopy. It's just kind of like that. Oh, you go, oh, oh. We've been going across at the top. I've been going across at the bottom. That okay. might, that would probably make it a lot yeah, easier. Yeah, go across at the top. Yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and then, huh? And back up to the. <laughs> oh, if there's so, any other letters anybody wants to see, let me know and I can do that. This is, oh. Okay, I can do this. Did that help? It, mm -hmm. it did, it did, and then I did a backwards G, which turned into an E. That's okay. okay. No, I'm, it's going to happen now. Like, it is, I know it's going to happen. Thing. I guess to like find another blank part of my work notebook here. Ha! Underneath, uh, to-do list for the weekend. 
Well, now this is how you have to write your to-do list. Yeah, clearly I have to, I've got to write it out. Okay. I can exactly. All right. So. And you know, um, that's a perfect time to talk about the title of my book, which yes. is Practice Makes Progress. Because the reason, um, honestly, the reason that I called it that, you know, my editor and I, we were kind of trying to come up with what is the title of this going to be? Because we knew that it was a creativity journal, but what do you call it? Um, and she was like, you know, when I think about you and the way that you teach and what you tell people, the thing that I've heard you say more than any other phrase is practice makes progress. And she was absolutely right, because every time that I lead or teach a workshop, any time that I'm in front of people, I'm always, always saying practice makes progress because I think society as a whole, you know, has done us a huge disservice by giving us the phrase practice makes perfect. Mm. It takes us and, you know, and I'm a, a recovering perfectionist myself where, you know, you feel like if I just work harder, you know, if I, I do a little bit more, I'll be perfect. And then we look at everything that's not perfect as a failure. And that's so far from the truth. I feel like every time we practice, every time we repeat something, we get better and better at it. And we've got this journey, we've got this progress. And when we're so focused on being perfect, which none of us are ever going to be, I mean, I don't want to burst your bubble today, but <laughs> I'm not perfect and you're not perfect either. And so, you know, when we're so focused on this ideal of perfection that we're never going to reach, we're always feeling like we're failing and we're ignoring that entire journey, all of that progress and not giving it its due. So I think, um, you know, that's why that phrase is so important to me. I have people who try to learn to letter or try to do different crafts and things. And if it doesn't turn out absolutely perfect, which it never, ever will, okay. they get really down on themselves. And they're like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not an artist. I'm no good. I can't. And I just want to be like, wait, practice, try it again. Do you see how much better what you're doing right now is than what you did 10 minutes ago and what you did yesterday and what you did five years ago? When I look at my lettering when I first started, and I was teaching people very shortly after I started, you know, I was putting stuff out there on the internet, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at it now, and I'm like, this is so <laughs> different than what I do now. I've learned so much. You know, there's such a journey. Um, and so I always encourage people, you know, whether it's the lettering or any skill that you want to learn, practice really does make progress. And even, you know, we talk about muscle memory when we're riding a bike or driving a car. Crafting is no different. Mm -hmm. Lettering is no different. It mm -hmm. gets in your muscles. I could write my to-do list like this without even thinking okay. because I've done it so many times. And so I'm constantly encouraging people just keep trying, just keep doing it, repeat it. And that repetition is going to make you better and better. Gotcha. So, all right. So for, for the sake of showing progress, I don't know, we're going to start. I got, okay. So you can see the hey. things I was trying to do here, and I got a little messed up on the I's and the N's and the G's and the S's. And I tried again over here, and I got a little more messed up. But then I, I did end up, I think, having somewhat of a success yeah. over there. So I'm sure that uh, at some point the people who work with me will, will watch this probably in the morning when they're editing it and, and putting it up and making sure that it's, you know, we do all the links and everything. And they will tell me all about my artwork. It's it's. It will, it will, it will. I hope bring them a modicum of joy seeing me try and do art. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's wonderful. Better. It's better. It, it's definitely it got better. Okay. okay. Yeah, and you know, one of the other quotes that I talk about in the book is creativity takes courage, and it absolutely does. It takes courage to try a new skill because we're all afraid of failure, mm -hmm. and it takes courage to share what you've made with others because we're always afraid that somebody's going to laugh. And you know, at the end of the day. It's, it really is a courageous act anytime that we make something because we're putting a part of ourselves out there in the world where one of the quotes says an artist is present in everything he creates. And it's absolutely true. You know, whatever we make, there's a little bit of us in it. That's why handmade gifts are so valuable, you know, because it's a little bit of that person. They're giving themselves to you. And so, you know, I think there's definitely a lot of courage in putting that out there because you're vulnerable. And um, so I just, I'm so proud of you for doing that and for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm, I'm here to, to, you know, as I said to a friend of mine, you know, like I, I referenced a long time ago, uh, try to live a little more creatively. So here we are. I think that's fantastic. 
And that's honestly my hope behind this book is that, you know, every person who picks it up will live a little bit more creatively. Mm-hmm. That, you know, the goal is to discover your creativity. You know, maybe you feel like you're not creative at all, or maybe you know that you're creative in a particular area, but not sure what else you can do. Uh, so to discover your creativity, to explore it and to express it and enjoy it mm-hmm. and share it with others. So that's really um if one thing could happen <laughs> from putting this out in the world, it's that that's what happens when it gets in readers' hands. Awesome. Well, I can I can tell you that I am I am already excited to play around with it a little bit and just try and do some some creative journaling and whatnot. And I'm sure my you know if my therapist ever sees this, she'll also be very appreciative that I'm trying to do some creative journaling and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I, I guess if it's okay, I do have a couple of quick questions for you before yeah. we before we let you go. I know you know we've had you for almost an hour now. Um, so I, I'm going to try and limit myself to just three. Um, so my first question is uh, sort of the the obvious one that no creative person wants to hear, especially once they've finished a big project like writing a book. But are you working on anything else? Is there anything new coming in the pipeline? Have you got any other ideas on what you'd want to create next? So my next new book <laughs> is actually... Um, it just went through the last author review and is being sent to the printer in Asia right now. It's called Doodle Everything. Oh, okay. And yeah, this one, it's, um, it's really fun. It's something, it's different because in the past, every book that I've created has been me going to my publisher. Mm-hmm. I love the people at Page Street so much because they're always like, yeah, okay, what else? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's always been me going to them saying, what can we do? I have this idea. Let's do this. And this time they came to me and they said, we feel like there's a real need for a doodle book for grownups. And kids can, of course, use it too. But we feel like what's out there right now is made for kids and we want something that's for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so it's doodle everything and it has about 450 different images doodles. And they're broken down step by step and they're broken into sections like um, around town or at the beach and in the snow and the holidays, that kind of thing. Um, and it was so much fun to create. My favorites, I'll tell you, are the animals. Mm-hmm. I got to do some really fun things that I'd never tried to doodle before, like a stingray and oh, a God. jellyfish and a polar bear. And, you know, some things I've doodled a million times, but some things just never came up. So. Yeah, yeah. Stingray, that would be one that would, I don't, I don't think Stingray would come up all that often, but okay. Yeah, yeah, and like snorkel gear and that, (laughs) okay, Um, but yeah, so it's, it's pretty exhaustive. Um, I told them I'm a little nervous about it saying doodle everything because there will be a person that's like, I want to doodle a rhinoceros and that's a rhinoceros, but Mm -hmm. uh, you know. As, as many things as I could. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but that is set to release in October of this year. Ooh, okay. Got to love yeah, a spooky so. time release. Um, yeah. So that actually leads into my, my second question, which is kind of a, a great one. What's something recently that you've created that you're really, really proud of? Hmm. Recently. Um, let's see. I've been doing a lot of holiday stuff right now. Um, I'm working on things. Um, I have a book release party that's planned for Saturday. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I'm doing um, like little magnets and washi tape cards. Um, I don't know that that's what I'm most proud of, though, because those are just really simple little things. Um, Actually, I recently, this is fun. um, I was inspired by, remember I told you about the 101-year-old grandma-in-law? Yeah. She came and she stayed with us for 10 days back in January because living, they had COVID. Um, and so we had to get her out of there. And she came and stayed with us uh, mm-hmm. for 10 days. And she was a delight. And we heard all of her stories, including her love story. And it was the sweetest, sweetest thing. I'll try to keep it short. But yeah. she was living in Syracuse. And her name is Barbara. And then her husband was Tom. And Tom, he came to Syracuse to be um to train as a pilot in world war ii and they met at a uso dance she was um, one of the girls that volunteered to dance with the soldiers and they danced and he said take off your name tag if you would because i'd like you to be my dance partner forever i mean like (laughs) and and so yeah so they ended up um he was there for about three months in training and they were of course dating each other and then they wrote letters Mm -hmm. throughout the whole war he came back and two weeks later they got married 
and he sent her a parachute so that she could have it made into her wedding dress. Oh. And it was just, it's just the coolest thing. And so it got me thinking about the idea of repurposing fabrics um, into other things and being meaningful and sentimental. And so I created this project. Um, I have one over here. If you just wait one second, yeah, I can show you. Absolutely. Um, but a lot of times we have um, these sentimental fabrics, like my grandfather's flannel shirt mm -hmm. um, that I got when he passed away. Or, you know, we have like boxes of baby clothes and you know, I've got tons of my son's baby clothes and things that I just couldn't get rid of or a blanket or grandma's dish towel or apron or something. And so they sit in boxes and we don't do anything with them. And so what I decided to do was make these, I called them sweet memories hearts. And I just took the fabric and I cut two identical hearts and stuffed it with poly pellets and I hand stitched around it because something about it felt like I needed to do it by hand, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I did. And then I just added a little ribbon and you can put it on the mantle, you can stick it in your sock drawer or whatever. But I felt like this was a way that you could kind of connect with something uh, that's really special and meaningful because in boxes, I mean, it's not doing anybody any good. And I felt like it was a way to kind of make those memories tangible. Yeah. Um, so it's not like it's the world's most groundbreaking craft, but like, I was oh. really proud of thinking of it. That's great because, though. Yeah. You know, it was something that anybody can do and it means something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so for my final question, uh, one of the things I've heard, and I think we've, we've talked about it before, is that in the process of creating a book, in that, in that creation, you learn things. You learn things about yourself. You learn things you didn't know before you started. Can you share with us something that you learned while writing, uh, while writing this book? Hmm. Um, I feel like of all my books, this one was the most therapeutic for me to write. <laughs> because like as I'm thinking about how these quotes apply to creatives, I'm thinking about how do they apply to myself. And so one of the things, um, there's a chapter in here about having uh, numerous PhDs, projects half done. Mm. Um, and I realized just how many things I've started and then I set aside and I don't come back to them. And so in the chapter, you know, it was this process of, okay, we're going to sit down and we're going to look at these projects that are being stored. And we're going to say like, okay, is this something that I'm going to finish right now? Is this something that I want to come back to? Or is this just something I need to say goodbye to? Mm -hmm. And it was really <laughs> advice for myself because I tend to hang on to things and be like, but maybe <laughs> I might need it. I might come back. Um, and I just really needed that push. So I was doing the exercises as I was writing them. And it was the same thing with organization. Um, I don't know if you can see behind me. Yes. Um, this, this is my dream box. It's literally called a dream box. It's by a company called Create Room. And oh, it's familiar one of with those. those. I've, I've eyeballed them every once in a while. They pop up on my Pinterest and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't do enough crafts to need that, but I need that. Well, you could use it for non-crafts, too. You could use it as an office. You could use it, you know, like my friend does Mary Kay. She could totally use it as, like, the home base for her Mary Kay business. Okay. But, I mean, the whole thing, like, you know, it closes up into a cabinet, and then you open it and open it again, and it's got all the, you know. And so I had to, as I had just gotten it when I was in the midst of writing the book, and I needed to organize it and organize all my supplies. And like I said, I'm a hoarder. And so I had like all these supplies for crafts I don't do. Mm -hmm. And I had like 8,000 clothes pins and you know, <laughs> what do I need all those pipe cleaners for? And so as I was writing the steps that I want readers to take to organize and create a clean and inspiring space, I had to do it myself. <laughs> and so I think, um, I don't know that it's like something I learned, but it's definitely something that changed me as I was going through it. And now yeah. I've been so much more organized and I have, you know, I feel like I have projects completed instead of a bunch of things just sitting around half finished. <laughs> gotcha. Well, that is a learned thing. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So now comes the part of the show where I do have to be shameless uh, and talk about the store. Like Go for it. Um, so if you liked the show tonight and you were like, oh my gosh, I need prog uh, practice makes progress because I need to, I need to do some creative stuff in my life. I want to fast. No, judgment. Exactly. Practice on my lettering. Practice anything. I just want to practice and get some progress. And you want to support a local bookstore while you're doing it. You can do both of those things. Uh, fine, bye, dog. Uh, you can. Uh, 
You can shop with us online at townbc.com. That's C-O-W, N is in Nike, E is in Echo, B is in Bravo, C is in Charlie.com. Or if you are local or you're planning to make a visit out to Pennsylvania and you don't mind coming into the store or you prefer to come into the store, we're happy to have you. You can visit us. Uh, we are in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. We're right across the street from the largest Wegmans in the country. Um, and we're, we're here. We're here for you. And we have got not only Practice Makes Progress, but we also have, uh, what was the other hand lettering book that we did with you before? Um, did you, because the first one is hand lettering for relaxation. Is that the one you have? It might be. It was the one that we did the the last event that we did together. Oh, then it wouldn't be. Um, it's probably that was last year or two years ago. Probably this one, hand lettering yeah. off the page. We have that one as well. You can find both of these books in our events part of the store, or if you walk right past the events part of the store, they are also both in our art and design part of the store as well. Uh, and see, look at that demoing the books. I should do that. That would be smart. But uh, all right, so. With that all being said, uh, thank you, Amy, so much for spending some time with me tonight. And thank you, everyone, for watching me try and create art. And uh, thanks for the instructions, Amy. And I, uh, I really appreciate everyone being here tonight. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Be safe. Be dry or warm, whatever the weather is like, wherever you are. And uh, take care. Bye, everyone.